made possible through support from ARC Thrift Stores, Colorado Developmental Disabilities Council, Developmental Pathways, and the ARC of Aurora. A Think Change Training. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode within our multi-part series talking about substance use and people with developmental disabilities. My name is Erica Dennison, and I am your host today, joined by a special guest from our community. And while today's episode may look a little bit different, uh, sound a little bit different because we are meeting virtually, all of the content that we are going to be discussing and sharing is incredibly relevant to this multi-part series. Um, and so because we're relying on the internet, if we do have any glitches or random things happening, we appreciate your flexibility if um, that does come up. But we are just going to hope that we are good to go and we don't run into any issues. Um, so I am so excited about today's episode with our special guest from our community. Uh, we're going to be talking about systemic gaps and policy solutions. Uh, so without further ado, might you introduce yourself to whoever may be tuning into this episode? Hi, everyone. I am Senator Daphna michelson Janay. I represent Colorado's 21st Senate District, which is Commerce City, uh, Federal Heights, South Westminster, Bennett, Keensburg, Strasburg. It's a pretty big district, um, but I work all over the state. I was chair of the House Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Committee when I was in the House. I served seven years in the House, and um, I serve on the Health and Human Services Committee now in the Senate. And it's nice to meet you. Well, thank you for being here. You sound like you are a very busy person, <laughs> <laughs> covering quite a broad, uh, wide range of geographic areas within our community. It is very, very varied. Yes, absolutely. That's a nice way to say it. <laughs> well, I'm really excited that you're here today. Uh, Anne Noonan, who was featured in our first episode within this series, recommended that you join us for this discussion. So Let's just dive on in. Um, my first formal question for you is, what are some of the systemic gaps that currently exist in addiction treatment and support services for people with developmental and other disabilities? I think the biggest thing that we hear about from the community is that if there is a co-occurring um, disorder, the substance use disorder treatment services won't take you. And then it becomes your primary concern is whatever the other um, uh, disability is, and then you can't get service. And you can't get it paid for if you can get service. So I think that's the biggest challenge we hear about. That and the lack of the lack of enough resources. Yeah, I would agree. And um, some other episodes that we had um, that too was shared when people said, you know, if someone has a blended identity, the resources and access to that can be really tricky to um, arrange for someone who may be duly diagnosed. So um, I appreciate your feedback on that and as well as what you're hearing within our community. Um, in a previous episode, we did discuss how harm reduction may help with recovery um, how do you feel that harm reduction extends to a policy level? Well, I'm a big supporter of harm reduction. I will tell you that it is a political hot potato. And mm. uh, we have tried very hard to put harm reduction tools into place in Colorado, and those efforts have failed. Um, I'm not sure what the the magic is. Um, in explaining harm reduction, but there is just this feeling that handing out syringes or handing out glass or handing out condoms, that um, uh, these things are helping to perpetuate an illness as opposed to helping prevent disease spread and and hopefully overdose. Um, so it's a it's a big battle. Uh, there are harm reduction supporters and there are harm reduction antagonists. And uh, we go at it every legislative session and we're about to go at it again, just coming up January 10th. Oh, my. Well, I, you know, from what I've learned about it, because it also is a new concept for myself, to be honest, you know, our bread and butter at the work that with the work that we do is all developmental disabilities. So when we loop in substance use or harm reduction, it's it's definitely a new concept to me. Um, but it does sound like um, it also helps 
um, from what it sounds like, it, it makes it sound like making what is out there a little bit safer for folks. Yeah, I, I there's this, the, the harm reduction philosophy is we're going to meet you where you are. And if right now you are a needle using individual, we want to make sure you're using safe needles. And we will do what we can to support you in making sure you are using safe needles or that you simply understand the risks with using dirty needles, or you understand the risk with using contaminated glass products for um, if you're inhaling your substances. So it's, it's the, the misnomer is that you're just helping perpetuate the illness. Um, this is an open door to start having conversations that help people get better. And um, we miss that opportunity a lot. And it's, you know, it's controversial. Yeah, it sounds like it is. And it sounds like it probably will continue to be controversial. I think it's probably hard to get everyone on the same page. So we probably will continue to have, what did you say, hot potato topics? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> during, each, during each legislative session. I appreciate your perspective on that. Thank you. Um. How would you say, uh, from your perspective, how can policymakers and advocates work to reduce stigma and discrimination against people with disabilities who may struggle with addiction and promote more positive and inclusive attitudes towards this community? I mean, is, it, is there some data that we need to be looking at or collecting to help identify what is needed in the community? Well, it certainly wouldn't hurt to have some data that identifies how many people in the disability community are facing substance use disorder and are facing discrimination and trying to get treatment. Um, that data always turns in, helps us turn it into money um, or legislation or policy. Uh, so collecting that data would be paramount. Um, and I think the number one thing that we can do right now is talk to people with addiction, talk to people who are facing disability and addiction together, and uh, let's see where they are and let them know that we are here and we accept them as they are. I, I met with uh, a woman, a woman with a disability in a wheelchair yesterday um, who is just clean a year. And she talked about how she was approached by a, a, a community worker who was willing to see her as a person, even though she was homeless, living in a tent and disabled. And there is that feeling, she said, that we are not human. And if we can approach people and see them for the human beings that they are and understand that there is promise in each human being, then we can absolutely make a difference and we can connect with them on a human level and help them get the support that they need. Because as you and I were discussing prior to this call, we have a rich a, a bevy of riches in Colorado for support. But if you don't know it exists and you don't know it's out there, you're not going to have access to it. And if you don't see yourself as a human being, you're not going to initiate that outreach for support. Mm, interesting. That's, you know, when you talk about people sharing their lived experiences, I mean, you had a community member share with you their story. Would you, would you say that, you know, from someone from a Senator perspective, you know, having people share their lived experiences and the challenges they face can help kind of shift things within our community and make better programs or access to services, things like that? The voice of people with lived experiences is critical in any formation of legislation because, you know, the, the statement, nothing about us without us is, is, um, is, is, is real. Uh, if, if we try to create policy without the people who are being impacted that by that policy, we will hurt those people inevitably. So making sure that lived experiences at the table during um, stakeholding, also very critical that people with lived experience come and testify at the Capitol. And you can do that virtually over Zoom from wherever you are, 
uh, or you can physically come into the Capitol if that's a possibility for you. Um, it is somewhat accessible. It's called accessible, but it's hard accessible. Um, uh, but I would encourage anyone who has the capacity to either Zoom or come in and share your lived experience when we're talking about policy that has to do with you. Great, great recommendations and suggestions and tips for people like I could see how it could be maybe a little daunting, right, to share your lived experience, especially something that's so private, but it really does sound like, you know, without sharing those personal stories that that really, that's really how change is driven. Yeah. And if I could add another little tip in, yeah. in some committees, you get three minutes and in some committees you get two minutes. So if you write down and time yourself with a three minute statement, tell them who you are, who you represent, why you are there, what is the outcome that you want from them and how do you want them to get it? And if you answer those questions and write them down and just read your piece of paper, you will do excellent. Awesome advice. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, my final question for you is what are some of the policy and funding changes that need that are needed to ensure that addiction treatment and support services are accessible and inclusive for people with disabilities, uh, particularly those who face barriers um, to care? Yeah, I think the first thing that we have to address is not allowing um, uh, substance use disorder treatment services providers to disqualify you simply because you have a disability. And, and we can't allow insurers to disqualify payment for services because you have a co-occurring condition. And um, I think that those would be the, the hugest policy changes that we can make um, I know that there was an interim uh, committee that I was not on. So I know that there are a number of pieces of legislation coming forward, which I don't know about yet. And I look forward to supporting those pieces of legislation that came out of the committee because we do have to address the issue of, of discrimination in treatment. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that valuable advice for people, as well as you know giving people kind of those little nuggets of things that they need to consider. I mean, you brought up the insurance issue. I mean, that I think that is something that people may not often think about when we're talking about, oh, you have a dual diagnosis. What are those barriers that you're going to run into? I think that's a really good example. Um, those are all of the formal questions that I have for you. I super appreciate your time. Is there, do you have any closing thoughts or um, final thoughts that you would like to share with whoever may be tuning into this episode? Yeah, reach out to your legislators. In Colorado, it's super easy. All of the information to find us is on ledge.colorado.gov. So leg.colorado.gov. And you can find our phone numbers, you can find our email addresses, and tell us the barriers that you're facing. Because if you communicate with us what those barriers are, we can look at them and say, okay, from a policy angle, is there something we can do to help? And many times there, there are things we can do to help. And we need to hear from you to tell us what to do. We work for you. So please feel free to tell us what to do. Kindly, please. <laughs> please be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Senator Michael Sanjane, I incredibly uh, value your valuable time today in uh, joining me for this brief discussion about systemic gaps and policy solutions as we're talking about substance use and folks with developmental disabilities. So um, final thoughts for everyone, use your voice, share your story. Together we can make change. Um, like you had said previously, nothing about us without us. Uh, the disability voice matters. Um, so until next time, uh, I hope you stay healthy and well and stay curious, everyone. Take good care.